Hey guys, so before we get into this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. Um, I'm trying to hit as many subscribers as possible, I'm trying to reach as many goals as I possibly can. The goal right now we're sitting at is to get up to 35 subs, after that we're going to be aiming for 50, after that we're going to be aiming for 75, and then 100. So uh, please guys, uh, try and subscribe, like the videos. Everything you can do, or everything that you guys do, really helps me out to show my videos to more and more people. But thank you very much, let's get into it. Alrighty guys, welcome to this next little video. Today we are going to have some fun with X58 AM3 FM2+. So the premise of this video is actually very very simple. We're going to be taking X58, comparing it to AM3 and FM2+. These two platforms, being AM3 and FM2+, are the platforms I actually have the most experience with. As much stuff as I do about X58, I've spent way more time with, well, not these motherboards, but both of these CPUs. Now, the motherboards that I have here are, well, actually all three of them are MSI. These two are premium overclocking boards for their platform. X58, not so much. But, like I said, we're going to be comparing X58 to two other platforms. And we're not going to give X58 any advantages. Dual channel memory. And we're overclocking all three of them. Now I know for a fact this and this overclock pretty well. This guy, not so much. Alright, we're going to be doing some synthetic benchmarks as well as some actual gameplay benchmarks. All the games that I've selected for today's video are all CPU intensive and CPU bound games. Some multi-core, some single core. And some of the uh, test scores will kind of surprise you because it's actually really interesting. But I think after this video, we'll all understand why X58 is simply superior than these other two platforms. Let's get started. Also, guys, a few things I forgot to add originally. CPU cooler that we're using is a Scythe Mugen 4. And the memory we're going to be using is 8GB of DDR3. This is my Corsair overclocking memory that I've actually ran in quite a few of my builds. I really like this stuff, and I know it can easily hit 2100 MHz. I don't know why, but it definitely can. And for GPU... You guys might recognize the cooler, but this is not the original Platinum Matrix, I can tell you that much. So we're going with an R9-290. It's not a 290X, but it is an R9-290 with a very nice cooler on it. Alright guys, before we start getting into some of the synthetics, let's actually get to know our CPUs a little bit better. So, our i7 was an i7-930 running at 2.94 for the base clock. Now that was the uh, what it boosted up to out of the box settings. I didn't change anything about the uh, memory. I didn't change anything about the CPU. I literally just put in the CPU, loaded optimized defaults, and went. OC for the i7-930 was 3.6. Like I said, I didn't really want to give the X58 platform any advantages. I could have pushed that overclock to probably about 4.0, maybe 4.1 if I felt lucky but I did not want to try pushing it all too far because then it would have just destroyed these other two CPUs even more handedly and I didn't want to essentially make this com this video completely invalid and also I know there are some people literally frothing at the mouth right now saying why did I use a quad core all of these CPUs are quad cores I did not want to throw another six core in the mix or I did not want to throw a six core into the mix because then yet again it just would even more invalidate anything uh, that these other two CPUs could achieve. So, that is why we chose the i7 for the X58 platform. So, for the next platform, the FM2 Plus platform, we had the Athlon X4 760K. Now, the 760K I've had for quite a while. This is actually a CPU that I've held on to now for probably a good four or five years. So, I have a lot of experience with it and I know how far I can push it. But out of the box, this thing has a base clock of 4 GHz. And when I overclocked it, I only got it up to 4.6. I had it at 4.8, but it was unstable. And I decided I wanted to have all of the synthetic benchmarks, or all the benchmarks that we're going to be doing today, at a stable core clock. So I decided to bump back to 4.6, which is what I actually ran it at for a very long time. And then for our final platform, we had the Phenom 2 X4 
955 Black Edition. Now this CPU was kind of designed for overclocking out of the box, but it had a pretty decent core clock, all things considered, out of the box for out of the box settings at 3.2. And when we overclocked it, I've been able to push it further in the past, but today I was not very lucky, or I guess I shouldn't say today, but when I was doing all of my synthetics and all my overclocking and testing, I was not able to get it any higher than 3.71. 3.71 is what I ran all the tests at for all the OC settings. And like I had said, both the Athlon and the Phenom are both on premier overclocking boards for their particular platforms. The was it, FM2 Plus is actually a A88XM gaming motherboard, and the uh, AM3 platform is a FX790 Duron, Dermon, whatever MSI's old uh, overclocking system was. So let's actually get into our first synthetic. Now the first synthetic that I actually decided to test was 3D Mark Firestrike, and the reason I decided on 3D Mark Firestrike instead of something like Time Spy was because of the GPU. I didn't want to become super GPU bound, but I still wanted to have a little bit of a GPU bound, just so I could give each of the CPUs a little bit of chance to stretch their legs and show what they might actually be, uh, be capable of at 1080p for gaming. Out of the box, only two of the three CPUs were actually adequate for a 3D Mark. The i7 wasn't. Looking at the base scores, we've got a CPU score of 3,293. Now why is that CPU score so low? The reason that the CPU score is so low is because for the physics test, when they start bringing in more and more entities to create a higher CPU load, um, if your CPU drops to 0 FPS at any point, it automatically stops the test, so it keeps itself from crashing or crashing out the computer, or lagging out completely. So the i7 was simply not able to handle some parts of that test, and because of that, we've got such a low CPU score. The next CPU that we've got is the Phenom 2 955. Now the 955 actually got an out-of-the-box CPU score of 4,616, which is very respectable considering the fact that it just outperformed the i7, but the i7 is only running at 2.9, when the Phenom is running at, what was it, 2 point, or 3.2, which is significantly, significantly better than what I thought it was going to be. And then the last base score for a CPU, we had the Athlon 2 X4, or the Athlon X4, and that bad boy got a 4,170 out of the box score. So it was good, but not great. Moving to an overclock. And this is where things just completely got blown out of proportion. The CPU score for the i7 when it was overclocked was 8,553. It didn't just excel at that test, it completely destroyed the test. You go up to the uh, 955, you gain, or you go up to 5,316. And the 760 went from 4,100 up to 4,900. Which is funny, because I figured that the Athlon was going to get a little bit better performance than that, but it didn't even crack the 5000s with this particular CPU load. And the GPU scores simply are a product of the CPUs not being able to handle the load. Now, the i7 was able to do an overall score, when overclocked, of 9830, when the other two were 8700 and 7600 just really showing how much a CPU impacts gaming performance. It's feasible in today's day and age to use an R9-290 with any of these three CPUs because the R9-290s can be picked up for anywhere from 50 to 60 bucks and they're pretty decent performers all things considered. Moving on to the next test, we have 3 Mark Skydiver or Skydive. Um, now, just kind of more glossing over the numbers, at the base clock, yet again, the i7 was not able to handle the CPU test, while the other two CPUs actually handled it better than what the i7 did, simply because of their core clock uh, superiority. Then when you move to overclock, the i7 knocks both of them completely out of the water. For overall GPU, or for overall test scores, 
the i7-930 when overclocked got 21,000. When looking at the other two, they both got 16,000 when overclocked. Now the base score, or the uh, the out of the box experience for the i7-930 was really poor at 12,000 when the other two got 15,000. Really showing how much core clock, really showing how much core speed matters when it comes to gaming performance. Now this was a much more CPU bound test than GPU bound test, just to really show you, just to show even more about how powerful the i7s are on top of these two platforms, or over top of these two platforms. Next test. All right, now we get into the real game testing, and I chose, for the first game, Grim Dawn. The reason I chose Grim Dawn is because it is very single core intensive. It can really only use one core and two threads, actually effectively. It does not do a good job of having more of a multi-core uh, solution, at least as of right now. Um, looking at the just raw numbers really shows you how much that's, or like how true that actually is. The base clocks really don't do the CPUs, any of the CPUs justice at 71, 66, and 84. But then overclocked, the i7 rose to 143 average FPS, with the 1% lows and 0.1% lows getting significantly better. But then both of the AMD machines, yes, improved, but still fell short. And one thing that I had kind of talked about was how the Athlon 2 is such a high base clock out of the box that when actually overclocking it, you really don't get a whole heck of a lot more performance. Now, the i7 doubled. The um, Black Edition, or the uh, 955, uh, gained 20 FPS. 21 FPS, actually. And then the Athlon only gained 5. Out of an average score, it only gained 5 FPS. And its 1% lows and 0.1% lows were actually lower. So... Take that one as you will, but Grim Dawn is very, very single core intensive, and doubling the threads gave the i7 a significant lead above the other two AMD CPUs. The next test was, in my opinion, the most real world one, Dota 2. Now, Dota 2 is still a very, very popular game, and there's a lot of people that play Dota 2. I play Dota 2. I spend most of my time playing Dota 2. Looking at the averages for the base out of the box clocks, both of the AMD CPUs overtake the i7 once again. But then the moment you drop the overclock on all three of them, the i7 just walks away from them. Which genuinely just shows the superiority of the Intel platform over AMD back in this day and age. There was a reason for a very long time that people were only ever building Intel PCs because of the single core performance, because of the overclockability of x58 and the Z platforms being like uh, what Z77, Z68 for the um, first and second gen, or sorry, for the second and third gen um, i5s and i7s for the K SKUs. There's just so much more performance that these CPUs will actually give you. And remember, this is all with the same graphics card. Alright guys, moving on to our final test, which was an absolute torture test for all these CPUs. We turned on City Skylines with an extreme late game city. Very, very dense, very, very high population. I hovered the camera just a little bit over the city just so enough where you could see a lot of the see a lot of the NPCs moving around and all three CPUs tanked all three of these CPUs out of the box were bad all three CPUs overclocked were bad the i7 after overclocked had a 17 average fps while the other two had a 13 average fps so what that essentially means is when all three of these CPUs, all cores and all threads, were hammered at 100%, the two AMD CPUs were only able to achieve 13 FPS when the i7 was able to achieve 17. Yes, it may have double the threads, but that's the thing. The AMD, you can't 
enable hyper-threading. There is no hyper-threading on these older AMD chips, so you are stuck with the true cores and true threads. Alright guys, in conclusion, to wrap this video up, we can really see here how these two AMD, these older AMD platforms, simply do not hold up. Now, if I had an X6 series CPU, it might do actually significantly better than the X4. Um, but, guys, AM3, no, not AM3+, Plus, but just the standard AM3, it is not looking great for the future of that uh, platform. They don't support the latest instruction sets. You can't play Apex Legends on a Phenom 2 series CPU simply because they do not carry the latest instruction sets. And because they don't carry those instruction sets, there's a lot of games in the future that will simply not run on a Phenom 2 series CPU. Intel is different on that because they're the ones who pretty much set the standard for the, um, what is it, the, uh, the instructions for the clock cycles, which really, really helps out the whole argument for should I go Intel or AMD. And then to uh, kind of put the odd one out, the FM2 Plus series CPUs, they're decent, and out of the box, they're really not bad. Um, I played Dota 2 for four years, or three and a half years, on that 760K. I loved it. I love the crap out of that thing. I had it paired with a relatively cheap graphics card, the AMD HD 7750, and that's what I gamed on for a very, very long time. Now, in my opinion, nowadays, it's really not all that good. But once I got a taste of X58, I kind of couldn't look back, simply because these older platforms, these older AMD platforms, simply cannot hold up in 2020. They couldn't hold up last year, and they really couldn't hold up the year before. If you are on AM3 or FM2+, Plus, you really might want to consider upgrading to something like LGA 1156, LGA 1155, um, being first, second, third gen, Intel, uh, or maybe the AM3 Plus platform being for the actual FX series CPUs, being like the FX 8130 or was it 8350. Those CPUs can hold their own a little bit better than what the um, the Phenoms and the Athlons can do. I don't have any FX series CPUs on hand. I don't have any FX series CP or motherboards on hand. I would like to test them in the future. I do plan on getting some to test in the future, but I don't as of right now. So, um, yeah, just to pretty much end it, guys. The reason I love X58 is because nothing of what I've used in the past has been able to hold up against an X58 series motherboard, has not been able to hold up against an X58 series CPU. X58 simply outperforms everything that I've used in the past. So, thank you very much for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, do all that fun stuff, hit the bell icon. I'm trying to hit 35 subs, I'm hoping to hit 50, I'm hoping to hit 100, I'm hoping to hit 1000. So come on guys, help me out with this one. I plan on bringing you guys more content. Uh, after this one, we're going to have a video about how I fixed that graphics card, because that was a really interesting one. And, um, yeah, I'll see you later. Peace.